in England in 1592. There begins our tale, and all of it is true. True, all of London, Billboard, the great expand, covering folk in weeping sores and leaving thousands dead. From towns and cities, doctors they did flee, leaving their patients to die in misery. But one brave doctor stayed when all the cowards fled. Might not have been because he was too sick to leave his bed. Alas, tis my final hour. I will surely die. I am too far gone to recover. And for the plague, there is no cure. Unless, unless a cure might be found in the stars. Let me see now. According to the stars, the way to cure the plague is to treat the fever it provokes. Oh, can it be true? Might a disease so monstrous as the plague be cured by treating it as if it were an exceeding bad fever? Then I must use powerful herbs to bring the fever to crisis and break it. Let me see now. Angelica and dandelion for heat, a borage to provoke sweating, infuse them in wine, strain and distill the mixture to produce our most powerful strong water. Huzzah! I am cured! <laughs> I shall now go forth with my miraculous strong water to cure all London of the plague! God give you good day, madam. How may I... Are you Mr. Foreman? Um, Mr. Simon Foreman, the, the doctor? I, madam, I am indeed Dr. Simon Foreman. I bid you welcome to my consulting chambers. Uh, mistress, uh, mistress... Allen, Mistress Avis Allen of Lambeth. Uh, pray tell me your age, if you please, madam. I am three and thirty years of age. And how might I do you service this day, Mr. Allen? Uh, pray describe your troubles to me. Well, the pain started full late last eve upon retiring to bed. Not the time in the habit of retiring so late, but my husband did desire a special supper of cold meats to celebrate and give thanks for... for... Um, well, uh, in any case, it, it started in the night and it continued until dawning. That being the pain in my head, and the chundering. A moment whilst I make note of this. A headache and involuntary purging. Is that all? Aye, that is all. And thinking on it, my complaint to seem most trifling. And you... you are doubtless busy with important cases. Oh, like the plague! Yea, verily, mayhap, I should not have come after all. Good day, Dr. Foreman. I, I beseech you, pardon me, for I have wasted your time. Prithee, do not go. Uh, for I assure you, madam, your case verily is important to me. And tis important to you, is it not, Mistress Allen? Else you would not have come this day. Well, uh, I... 
Let us consult the stars now then, shall we? What is the cause of Mistress Allen's suffering? You are with child, Mistress Allen. It was the reason for your celebration last evening, methinks? I. But how did you know? I can see it in my chart, madam. There is a planet aligned with Scorpio at present, Scorpio being the constellation that rules over such matters. Uh, pray tell, how long has it been since your monthly courses? It has been 14 weeks since my courses, and yesterday I did feel the child quicken. So, indeed, twas the cause for our celebration, as you say. <laughs> for I, I have been with child before, you see, but tis never... And Mr. Allen and I do pray this one will be born alive. <laughs> there, there, dear lady. The presence of the planet Mercury in my chart does suggest you suffer from anxious passions on account of your condition. And given your ill-favoured history, I warrant twas the twin burdens of hope and fear that provoked your troubles last evening. Oh, I see. Pray take this flask of wine, madam. It has been infused with cloves, ginger root and cinnamon. Drink of it each morning, and you should soon feel much improved. Verily, oh, I will do as you advise. I thank ye heartily, sir. Fare you well, Dr. Foreman. Fare you well, Mistress Allen. Hey, sir. You are Simon Foreman, the physician, are you not? Uh, these are your rooms. Indeed, I am he, and well met, sir. Be it Thomas Blagg I have the honour of welcoming to my humble consulting chambers, the Dean of Rochester Cathedral. Indeed, tis I, Thomas Blagg. Uh, though it is not upon church business that I come to you this day, tis upon a matter of my own that I require counsel. I have lately been offered some very lucrative investment opportunities, and, uh, well, it is said that God speaks to us through the stars, does he not? Indeed he does. Tis well known that astrology is but a conduit for the word of God, as interpreted using scientific means. And now, these investments of which you speak, pray tell of them, if you please. Two merchant ships will shortly set sail on very lucrative trading expeditions. I do not possess the coin to invest in both. Hence, I must choose between them. And I must choose very wisely indeed. Mm, for sea voyages are most perilous. And if my ship were to founder or be captured by pirates, I would lose my entire investment. Aye, forsooth. It would be most lamentable. To say nothing of the poor souls who might lose their lives. Who are, naturally, the greater of my concerns. Aye, naturally. And whither might these ships be bound? The first is bound for the Spice Islands of the East. Tis a voyage to be undertaken by a ship named the Conquering Cherub. The other is the Pride of Yarmouth. She is to bring back sugar from the Americas. Have you now the information you require? Then perchance you may divine for me upon which of these two ships our Lord God has bestowed his divine blessing. Aye, Dean Blagg, we may now consult the stars. Should Thomas Blagg invest in the voyage of the conquering cherub, or that of the pride of Yarmouth? The stars advise you to invest in the ship named the Conquering Cherub. I see. And why is that? Well, I have calculated that at this very hour, 
upon this very day, the planet Mars and the constellation Scorpio do both dwell in that part of the sky we call the House of Children. And, as it happens, Mars is the ruler of Scorpio, hence we may say that Mars is presently exalted. Mars has been exalted by Scorpio, you say? And what might that mean? When exalted, Mars represents victory. And so, with victory in the House of Children, we may read this as a victorious child. Ergo, the conquering cherub. Ah, I see. Uh, for a cherub is a, is a kind of child, is it not? In sooth, I do find the science of astrology verily fascinating. <laughs> I thank you, Dr. Foreman. You have been most helpful. Tomorrow, sir. Pray tell, are these the consulting chambers of Simon Foreman, Doctor of Astrology and Physic? Indeed, tis I, Doctor Simon Foreman. And your name, madam? Emma Sharp of Shoreditch, sir. Five and twenty years of age. Welcome, Miss Sharp. And how may I do you service this day? Well, tis a trifle delicate. A man has asked me to be his wife. A dear, kind man. But, but, <gasps> I fear you will think me cold, Dr. Foreman. There, there, madam, whatever is the matter? Well, he is exceeding advanced in years. I do worry he may not be long for the world, and if he were to die, I do not think I could bear it. <gasps> Verily, I would not. Indeed, methinks I would rather not marry him at all. Am I very heartless, Dr. Foreman? Nay, not in the least, madam. Your fears are most reasonable. The man in the winter of his life is indeed more likely to die. I assure you, madam, tis a medical fact. But, methinks you wish to know whether this man be afflicted with a grave health condition, do you not? To wit, any ailment that might soon prove fatal? Forsooth I do. That is my question precisely. Why, Dr. Foreman, tis as if you have a gift for reading minds. <laughs> uh, merely the gift of logical surmise, madam. Let us see whether a judgment of the stars may calm your fears. Uh, does Mr... Uh, what was your gentleman's name? Mr. George Middleton, a wool merchant. <clears throat> does Mr. Middleton have any ailments that might hasten his death? I am full sorry, madam, but the stars give heavy news. Mr. Middleton suffers from a cardiac passion. Indeed, his heart may stop at any moment. He must avoid anything that might alarm or trouble his vital spirits. One shock could be enough to kill him. Oh, whoa, alas, poor Mr. Middleton. I thank you for your kind understanding, Dr. Foreman, and, and for your discretion in this matter. I will at once to my family go and beseech them not to make me accept Mr. Middleton's proposal. God give you good day, Dr. Foreman.
What is the meaning of this warning being put about by the College of Physicians? Do they mean to do me harm? It is true that I do not have a medical license. What am I to do? Mayhap the stars will advise me. It seems that if I'm to avoid prosecution by the College of Physicians, I must obtain a medical license. Towards this end, doubtless the best course is to serve my querents well, treating their illnesses and problems with intelligence and sensitivity. For if I do, they may favour me with letters of recommendation, and I can use these to petition the University of Cambridge to grant me a license. This man at the door who we've not seen before. Who is this man at the door who we've not seen before? Who is come to inquire dressed in such strange attire? Si, Senor, 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 I am just a little stiff. As you wish. Uh, Mr. Uh... Signor Ricardo Ferraro. I am a gentleman of Venezia, come to make a trade in London. Uh, Venice? Uh, uh, it is a fine city, I hear. And how may I do you service this day, Signor Ferraro? I am come with una problema medicale, and you are most great dottore who does cure all a London, eh? You cure a Ferraro too, see? Si? Forsooth, I will seek to do so, Signor... Pray, describe your complaints, if you please. Uh, is burning when I make the water. Pain during urination? See, si. and is pain down here. Molto pain. And pain in the lower back. Now, let us see what the stars can tell us. What ails Signor Ricardo Ferraro? "'Tis a case of stones in the kidney, I regret to say. "'But worry not, Signor. "'I will give you an ounce of my strong water to dislodge them. "'Drink this entire flask when you rise at dawn tomorrow. "'You may then expect to evacuate the stones "'by way of your privy member within just a few hours.' "'Ah, your famous strong water. "'This water tis said to cure the plague, eh? "'Hmm, I thank you, Signor Foreman. "'And now Ricardo Ferraro bids you good day.' So she is no beauty, tis true she lacks finesse, but every awkward hero needs his awkward princess. Ah, well met, Mistress Allen. Uh, pray tell, the last time I saw you, you were with child, methinks. Uh, pray tell, how fares... I would rather not talk about that, if you please. Oh, I see. I am full sorry, madam. What I'm come upon this? the matter I beg that brings. Your pardon, madam. I prithee, madam, say on. I'm come about the new law. I know not what to do, and I would have counsel. You are in trouble with the law, madam. Nay, 
At least not yet, but my neighbours have begun to remark unkindly upon my absences, uh, my Sunday absences from church. I am afeard one of them may soon denounce me. Ah, tis the act against recusants you speak of. The law that obliges Catholics to attend church and take the English sacrament. You are of the Catholic faith, then, I take it? Aye, a Catholic, uh, but as well a, a law-abiding woman and a full loyal subject of the Queen. Long may she reign. I do not doubt it, madam. But to take the Protestant sacrament, oh, tis heresy, so says the Pope in Rome. I risk being damned to hell if I do it, Dr. Foreman. Verily, I find myself in a most terrible bind. I see. Damned if you do, yet condemned if you do not. A cruel bind indeed. Well, let us see if the stars may untangle it for us. Should Mistress Avis Allen attend Protestant church services? fear the stars confirm your fears. You must attend church every Sunday, lest you risk being prosecuted for being a recusant. Oh, but, but, but then what of my soul, Dr. Foreman? Methinks I have a solution for that, madam. If you were to cross your fingers behind your back during the service, any Protestant oath you swear would not count. Of course, you must be sure to stand at the back of the church while doing so, so that only God may see, and no one else. Forsooth, what an ingenious notion! Oh, Dr. Foreman, you have saved me! You are so wise, sir. Tis so. Verily, it is most admirable. But, dear lady, tis you who is to be admired. The strength of resolve, your devotion to your faith, and your... Madam, would you care to... See my collection of Venetian glassware? I think I would. Indeed, I would like that very well. Good day to you, sir. I am Amelia Bassano of Bishopsgate, here for my consultation. Welcome, Mistress Bassano. Bassano, tis an Italian name, is it not? Aye, it is, sir. Though I was born in London, my family are from Venice. They did come to London to gain employment as musicians at the royal court. Ah, I, I know one of your countrymen, Riccardo Ferraro, another one of my querents. Mayhap you know him? He hails from Venice, too. No, sir, I do not know him. Venice is a large city, and as such is home to many thousands of men. And as I did mention, I was born in London. Uh, aye, of course. Uh, mayhap we turn our thoughts to what brings you hither this day. Uh, have you a question for me? Aye, sir, I wish to know what afflicts me, for my belly does begin to swell, and lately I oft find myself chundering after meals. Swollen abdomen and involuntary upward purging. Well, now, let us consult the stars to judge the cause of these troubles. What is ailing Mistress Emilia Bassano? I neglected to ask. Is there a uh, Mr. Bassano? I, my father still lives. Uh, I mean to say, are you yet married, Mistress Bassano? 
I presume you are, for the stars indicate that you are with child. <laughs> Wondrous news indeed. Ah, oh, I see. Of course, it is natural for a young lady to be a trifle anxious when she's expecting her first child. And I see you are anxious, are you not? I, Mr. Foreman, I own that I am. Well, doubtless you are anxious owing to the unpredictable nature of your condition. For instance, sometimes the child might emerge from its mother's womb early, weeks or even months earlier than anticipated. This possibility is a medical fact, and one that should be explained to any husband you may... Uh... Do you see what I'm saying, Mistress Bassano? Nay, not in the least, sir. Ah, some of my maiden querents, I assume you are still unmarried and therefore a maiden, when they find themselves inexplicably with child, they oft do not remain unmarried for long. I advise you to discuss this with your family without delay, Mistress Bassano. Doubtless they will be keen to make the arrangements for you. I see. Yes, of course, I must lose no time in finding a husband. I thank you, Dr. Foreman. Good day. Blessed morrow to you, Dr. Foreman. I am Mary Payne of Four Street in Lambeth, and come to seek your counsel about my neighbours. Good morrow, Mistress Payne, and well met. Ah, what trouble do your neighbours give you? Uh, they play their lutes into the night, perchance? Mayhap a, a neighbour has cast a malignant spell upon your cabbages. Why, sir, tis no trifling matter. Indeed, tis a matter of grave importance. Doubtless you do know we have a Catholic living on Four Street. A woman by the name of Avis Allen. Ah, yes. I did hear tell that Mistress Allen subscribes to the Romish faith. Uh, but tis no crime to be a Catholic, is it, madam? At least, not at present. Aye, but harbouring a Jesuit priest is, Dr. Foreman. These evenings past, I have spied a man sneaking in and out of the Allen's house. Tis my reckoning, the man is a priest who is going hither and thither all over Lambeth to perform the Catholic Mass and take confessions. Doubtless Mr. Allen is hiding him in one of those little cupboards. You mean to say you think Mr. Allen has installed a priest hole in his house? A secret room hidden behind the wood panelling of a wall? Indeed I do. I am certain that he has such a hole and that a priest is going in and out of Mr. Allen's hole from dusk till dawn. Uh, verily? Uh, how troubling. But surely you are mistaken, madam, for under the cover of darkness, how can you be sure the man you did spy was not Mr. Allen himself? Nay, nay, t'was not Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen is a fine, tall figure of a man, whereas the figure I did spy was very narrow and malformed in appearance. A scrawny little imp of a man he was. I see. Now, you must not think me intolerant, Dr. Foreman. If Mistress Allen must cling to her idolatrous backward beliefs, tis her own affair, and I have no wish to cause trouble for the Allens. And tis true that Mistress Allen does now attend church on Sundays and takes the English sacrament just as she ought to. But we residents of Four Street are decent English folk. We will not abide an agent of Rome sneaking around our neighbourhood, muttering incantations in some devilish foreign tongue. I think you mean Latin, madam. But before I act upon my suspicions, I think it wise to know if there be any truth in them. Then let us see what the stars can tell us. Uh, who is this mysterious stranger, and why does he frequent the Allen's house late at night?
Ah, twould seem the man you saw is a foreigner who's been secreted into the Allen house to aid Mistress Allen with their family difficulties. Family difficulties? Come, come, Dr. Foreman. Pray speak plain. Ah, well, as you doubtless know, the Allens have never been blessed with a living child. Mayhap tis the belief of Mistress Allen that the seed of a foreigner would prove more powerful than the, uh, demonstrably less successful seed of Mr. Allen. Then, tis naught but adultery. Fornication with a foreigner. Huh? Mistress Allen will pay dearly for such sinning. Her soul will be damned to an afterlife beset by the exquisite tortures of hell's capricious demons. Aye, well, according to scripture, that is technically true. But to harbour a Jesuit priest is a far greater evil. We must be glad that Mistress Allen commits naught but the sin of adultery. Conducted late at night with a man who gives forth strong foreign seed. You have given me much to think on, Dr. Foreman. Blessed day. I am glad to have been of service, Mistress Payne. When the querent does rock a, a continental, continental frock, when the querent does rock a continental frock, when his Italian flair features all facial hair, tis Ferrar. Ferraro. God give you good day, Signor. And how may I assist you? Tis I, Riccardo Ferraro. Come once again to see the great dottore, Simon Foreman. So I see. What brings you this day? I bring myself to you, so you trade my illness. It is very grave. And, uh, what might this illness be? Perchance we might start with your complaints. First problem is the laughter that cannot be controlled. <laughs> Uncontrollable laughter, you say? <laughs> Uh, I see. Anything else? Next problem, the dancing that cannot be controlled. Uncontrollable dancing. And yet, uh, you do not appear to be dancing at present. What can I say? It is uncontrollable dancing. I cannot control when I dance. Nay, nay, it is a fair point. Doubtless my disease, whatever it may be, is a very rare and very difficult to diagnose. But, of course, if it be beyond your medical understanding... Let me assure you, Signor, that whatever is said of us on the continent, the learning of we English doctors is unparalleled. There is no better medical care to be had than in London. Now, let us see whether the stars may tell us something of your unusual and troubling illness. Sounds to me like you're experiencing pain in your stomach. But how did you know this? Indeed, methinks you are stricken with a bout of colic. Most doctors do advise upward purging, but I have found the dog cure more efficacious in cases of colic. The dog cure? Aye. First you must find a dog lying idle on the ground. On any street in London you will find such a creature. Then you must kick the dog away Lower your breeches, and then make water upon the spot where the dog did lie. Uh, if you say so, Signor Forban. If we were not on English soil, of course, I would have said you were bitten by a tarantula. <laughs> but there be no such spiders in England. Our weather is much too cold for them. Indeed, only an overqualified quack who draws his medical knowledge from books alone would think such a diagnosis appropriate in this case. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> indeed. Most ludicrous. And in truth, the laughing and dancing you are troubled with may doubtless be attributed to your hot-blooded Latin temperament. Hmm. Uh, doubtless you speak it true, eh? Tis but a symptom of my hot Venetian blood. Ricardo Ferraro bids you good day. Why does this lady feel confined? 
Mayhap the world is too unkind. Nay, doctor, medicate her mind. Pray cure this comely lady. Pray cure this comely lady. Ah, good day to you, madam. Ah, uh, yes. Good day, Mr. Foreman. Pray tell, is your Venetian querent Ricardo Ferraro one of the patients you treat for troubles of the mind? Forsooth, his manner is right strange. I passed him at the door, and when I addressed him in the Italian tongue, he abruptly turned from me and ran away down the street. Nay, Signor Ferraro has no grave troubles of the mind that I'm aware of. Mayhap he was merely dumbstruck by your beauty, madam. Dr. Foreman, a man is rarely struck dumb by a woman's beauty. Indeed, tis quite the reverse. He is oft rendered all the more loquacious, plaguing her with ill-formed metaphors he believes are compliments, and with hasty declarations and invitations she has neither sought nor invited. Ah, quite. Uh, but let us turn our minds to happier thoughts. Uh, I did lately hear of your marriage to your cousin, Mr. Alfonso Lania, for which I must congratulate you. And, as I recall, you were with child when I last saw you. I, I was, as you correctly judged. And your child and husband are both well, I hope? I would rather not discourse on the subject of my husband, Dr. Foreman. As it pleases you, madam. What brings you this day? Lately I have been feeling heavy and lethargic. I do also find it hard to fix my attention upon the book I am reading or upon words I am composing. And yet, although I oft feel right tired, I am having difficulty sleeping. Ah, well, becoming a mother, beset with all the demands of a suckling babe, can force change upon the normal rhythms of life? Nay, it is not that, for I have employed a wet nurse for the feeding and much of the care of my son. Methinks I must have some kind of disease. I see. Let us consult the stars to see what afflicts you. What is ailing Mistress Amelia Lania? Mistress Lania, the stars indicate that your suffering is occasioned by melancholy, or, in other words, black bile. I see. And what treatment can you give me for it? Before we speak of treating your condition, madam, I think it wise we determine what has provoked it. You did express a desire not to speak of your husband, and I cannot help but think that such a reluctance reveals where the source of your troubles might lie, to wit, within your marriage. Would I be right in thinking this? Hmm... I do not wish to cause you distress, madam, but as a doctor, I do feel I must press you in case it is relevant to your troubles. My marriage is not a happy one, Dr. Foreman. Mr. Lanier and I do not agree on matters of money and strong drink. I see. And what are your opinions on these subjects? That he spends all our money on strong drink. He disagrees. And your husband cannot be brought around to see your point of view, nor you his, I presume. Well, the marital discord provoked by strong differences of opinion can oft engender melancholy in a wife. Until the matter is resolved between you, you may take a syrup of roses and chicory. Drink of it each day, and it will serve to reinvigorate your vital spirits. I will also have my manservant, William, bleed you of some of that excess bile. I thank you, Dr. Foreman. William, come hither and bleed Mistress Lania. What is their relation? We are, we are no longer sure. Since Foreman's now a patient, and is this the cure? Ah, my dear Avis, what a pleasure it is to see you. 
I have oft thought of our last... I cannot tarry long. My husband will be expecting me home. Of course, of course. But, dear lady, is something the matter? Of course. Do not all your querents come with a matter they wish an answer to? Well, yes, but... I wish to ask of the stars whether my... Uh, a, a man I am close with, a man who is not my husband, whether that man be also close with another woman. A man you are... I see. Well... If I am to judge the stars for you, I must ask you to be more precise. In what sense do you mean close? The platonic bond of friendship? Nay, close in the sense of being... intimate. I see. Then tis the familial tie of kinship, perchance. Nay, nay, I mean someone who... someone with whom I have shared physical relations. Verily, madam, if I am to give you an accurate reading, you must state your question clearly. Methinks you know full well what I ask. I bid you ask the stars whether my lover is, that is to say, be it true that he engages with another woman in acts of strumpy humpy. Madam, you astonish me. Tis unlike you to speak such indelicate words. Now, if I understand you correctly, you have a lover, and you wish to know whether he has been sharing his tender favours with another woman. I, but did I not verily say so? And now that we have at last fathomed your question, let us read the stars to fathom an answer. Has Mistress Allen's lover been unfaithful to her? stars are most clear, madam. Your lover has not been coupling with another woman. He has not? Forsooth, the stars say that your mind has been turned by jealousy and confusion. Now, if there is nothing further, madam... Oh, how relieved I am to hear you say this. Oh, Simon, what a fool I have been not to trust you. But, but you... this lover... t'was me all along? You, you were not speaking of some other man? I beseech you, pardon me, Simon. I had to know the truth from the stars, for, for I did hear tell of... of other women. But how could you not see? No other woman is to me so dear and fairly. I... Is it not clear to you that I... that I... Do you verily, Simon? Oh, my dear, sweet Avis. Good morrow, madam. I humbly welcome you to my consulting chambers and thank you for choosing my practice. Uh, Mistress... Fortescue. Mistress Sybil Fortescue. Well then, Mistress Fortescue, what may I assist you with this day? I come upon a most troubling matter, sir. I know not whether it is a medical matter or, or something else. I see. Pray describe your trouble to me, madam. Well, I suppose it all began with the dinner I hosted at my house last even. Mayhap you have heard of my dinners, Dr. Foreman. They are much talked about. Though I fear last evening's dinner will be talked about for all the wrong reasons. Talked about, you say? Yes. Indeed, invitations to my dinners are much sought after, for I host the most desirable of guests. Lords, bishops, poets, explorers, painters and the like. Why, last eve I hosted the famous Robert Lord Devereux, the playwright William Shakespeare, and the Bishop of London and his wife. As well as fascinating conversation, at my table I serve the very latest and most original dishes. 
Last even, I served an exotic green vegetable called a portato. So crisp and refreshing. My dear husband sent them home to me from the New World. Doubtless you have heard of my husband, Captain Fortescue. He is a great friend of Sir Walter Raleigh. I see. Your dinners do sound most excellent, Mistress Fortescue. Uh, but what occurred at last eve's dinner that has you so distressed? Well, in truth, t'was after dinner. We all felt a strong desire to take some air, and so we left the table to take a turn in some pleasure gardens nearby. But then, as we were walking along the path, right in the middle of the gardens, in full public view... Pray do not distress yourself, madam. Prithee, take your time. My guests and I were all of a sudden stricken with pain. We began chundering and voiding from our... But there was nowhere to turn, you see. There were no bushes close by to shield our modesty. T'was unspeakable. A moment, madam, as I note this down. Abdominal pain and simultaneous upward and downward purging of a most sudden and violent nature. Now, let us see how these stars explain this most distressing and unsavoury event. What troubled Mr. Sybil Fortescue and her guests last eve? <laughs> 